Good afternoon. Uh, we're almost halfway there. Uh, those who have registered and they're still on their way, they will find us um, having started with our webinar. Uh, welcome to the NRF Science for Society lecture. And today's uh, topic is employability of South African doctor, um, doctoral graduates. Before I tell you about why we have this uh, webinar today, I'll just start maybe uh, just with the house rules. Uh, and, um, and then I will introduce uh, our guests uh, later on. Uh, as you can see this morning, uh, we are, I think NRF is showing off, uh, as you know, uh, August is Women's Month uh, in South Africa. And what better way to celebrate women than to have women uh, scientists, you know, uh, talk to us. And uh, Obak is the only thorn amongst the roses this morning. Uh, so I, I'm hoping that uh, as, as, as the country, we will just appreciate that we're making progress in terms of, of, of women um, in the sciences in particular. So in terms of the, of the house rules, I just want to um, ask the, the participants to ask their questions on Q&A. And I know that there are others who are joining us on Facebook also, please do uh, send your questions as well. Um, it's been and uh, on the on the NRF um, Facebook page. Um, we are going to, as part of the questions, once we've had all the presentations, we are going to ask one or two of the participants to share their stories as well. Okay, fine. So this Thank is um, Lerato, please mute yourself. Thank you. Um, this is a, a this is going to be an interactive um, session. But with regards to the presentations, I will ask colleague um, uh, participants to please uh, wait until the end of the presentations, and at the at the very end, then we'll start um, the discussions. Also, uh, when you write your your question, if there is a specific um, person that you you would want to answer, please also highlight who the person is, uh, who the question is directed to. Now, why are we having this conversation today? This webinar was inspired by the first national tracer study that was completed in 2020, which traced um, the career paths of doctoral graduates who have obtained their qualifications from a South African university between 20, 2000, the year 2000 and 2018. The respective sample of graduates was across a range um, of sectors and disciplines. The study provided uh, accurate, precise, and general information of a wide range of issues, the employability of the doctoral graduates, the financing of those studies, the differences in the career trajectory between full-time and part-time studying students, um, the absorbi absorptive capacity of different employer employment sectors, the geography, geographic mobility of these graduates, as well as new insights into their uh, perspectives um, and uh, the utility of the postgraduate study. I won't get too much into the details because we're going to get a presentation on what this study, uh, what we got out of the study. So without a waste of time, I'd like to introduce our, our panelists. We have uh, Dr. Milandri Van Lille, uh, who is a senior researcher at this DSI NRF Center of Excellence for Cytometrics and STI Policies and the Center for Research and Evaluation Science, um, Evaluation Science and Technology. And she'll be the one who will be telling us more about this study. And uh, Dr. Am Amalea Konias Malka, uh, is the CEO of, of AP Management Consultancy. She holds a PhD in marketing management, specializing in digital uh, platforms. Uh, professor Kiulebu Khile Mutawung is a full-time professor, biometric scientist and director, technology transfer and innovation at uh, Deben University of Technology. And lastly, we have Babu uh, Begwihadebe is the director at the Department of Science and Innovation. You will, you will notice that I didn't say quite a lot about themselves. Their bios are very detailed um, and allow them to actually just give, give us a brief overview 
of of the uh, of the uh, of the uh, of themselves as they give us their presentation. We will start with Dr. Milendri, who will be our um, keynote, uh, who will give us the keynote address and share with us the findings of the study. Uh, thereafter, we'll then go in and have the, the other panelists as well uh, give us the, the uh, views. Dr. Milandri? Thank you very much, Dr. Musia. Um, I will share my screen. Uh, just before you start, uh, just for the purpose of being yes. written out of that, may I request all the other panelists uh, that we mute our videos in the meantime. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Um, and for the brief introductions, my name is Mandre van Lil, and I am a researcher at SciStip and Crest, um, as you've heard. And today I want to talk about the employability of doctoral graduates in South Africa. Um, before we start, I just want to acknowledge that this study, um, or the results that I will present here today, is based on a study that was done by Crest um, with, with a large team. Um, and we are the Center of Research and Evaluation Science and Technology based at the University of Stellenbosch. Um, so I will talk today about the employability of graduates who received their doctoral degrees at South African universities between 2000 and 2018. And when we talk about the employability of graduates, it is important that we firstly define what we mean by employability. Now, York defined the employability within the context of higher education as a set of achievements, skills, understandings, and personal attributes that makes graduates more likely to gain employment and be successful in their chosen occupations, which benefits themselves, the workforce, the community, and the economy. So you have received a brief background of the study, but I thought I will just revisit that. So this study, was the first national crisis study of doctoral graduates in South Africa. The study was funded by the DSI and managed by the Water Research Commission. Um, and the final report was released earlier this year, but the study was completed in 2021. So the study consisted of a few phases, but the primary study was a web survey, um, which yielded around 6,400 responses of doctoral graduates. Um, from the public universities between 2000 and 2018. Additionally, we conducted 113 qualitative interviews, primarily with graduates in the water sector, as this was one of the um, terms of reference from the, the WRC. And as I've mentioned, this is the first and most comprehensive tracer study of doctoral graduates in the country. Um, we received a very large response rate um, and I think this was primarily because of the interest in the topic at around 41%. And based on certain tests that we did, we, we found that we had a very representative sample. And for that reason, we can fairly, with, with fair confidence say that the results of our study can be generalized to the population of South African graduates who received their degrees over the, the study period. So it is important to briefly situate the results of our study within the South African context, um, and especially the policy context. So the National Development Plan set targets to increase the doctoral output um, to 5,000 by the year of 2030. Um, in 2020, we graduated just more than 3,500 doctoral graduates. Um, at the same time, the targets were set to increase the percentage of academic staff with a PhD to 75%. In 2020, this figure was around 50% for permanent academic staff at South African universities. So this means that there has been a substantial increase in the number of doctoral graduates over the past couple of years. Um, and also that a very large number, and we found this in our study, that the majority of doctoral graduates at, at 
South African universities study part-time. This means that they are enrolled for the degrees while being permanently employed or full-time employed. And this group largely consists of academic personnel at universities who are employed for the, who are enrolled for the doctoral studies while they are employed at the universities. Now, this proportion of part-time to full-time students, the 60-40 ratio, has remained largely unchanged in the last 20 years. Um, also, we found that students in the STEM fields um, are more likely to study full-time than students in the social sciences and humanities. So let's talk about the employment trajectories immediately after graduating a PhD. As I've mentioned, the largest share of our students were already employed at the time of doing their PhDs, and the majority of graduates remained with the same employer. So 20% of graduates accepted a postdoctoral fellowship on completion of their studies, and we found that only 2% of graduates indicated that they could not find employment after completing their doctoral degree. So stated simply, we can say that the vast majority of South African doctoral graduates are either already employed during their studies, or they find employment within the first year of graduating. But employability means more than just gaining an employment position. 70% of graduates indicated that they found employment that is directly related to their fields of expertise or training. But nearly 80% of respondents indicated that they could not find employment position that relates to their specific skills or their fields of expertise or the fields that they were trained in. And this for the first time gives us some context into you know, the, the quality of employment experienced by, by doctoral graduates. So we found that recent graduates, those who received the degrees within the last five years or so, um, found more challenges experienced more challenges in finding employment. So they were more likely than those who received their, grad their degrees 15 years ago to indicate that their current position or job is not related to their field of expertise. We also found that graduates in the social sciences and humanities reported more challenges in finding suitable employment compared to students in the STEM fields. So on average, over the whole period, Slightly more than 25, one in four doctoral graduates indicated that their current employment position was the only position available or the only option available. Now in the graphs on the right, you can see that this percentage has grown with time. So we see that larger numbers or biggest share of graduates who received their degrees recently said that they could not find a position or that the position that they found was the only one available, thereby not, not necessarily finding a position of their choice. So when we look at where our graduates work, we've already mentioned that, you know, two thirds of, of respondents were employed in the higher education sector at the time of the survey. And we also find that they have remained in the sector. So during the PhDs of those who reported that they were employed during their PhD studies, 61% of them were employed in the higher education sector. At the time of the survey, which means you know their current employment, this figure increased to 66%. This means that there is very little mobility in inwards and outwards of the higher education sector. We found that small percentages moved to the public and the business and other sectors. Um, and we found that some inward mobility into the public sector and business sector. No, I'm sorry, that must be outward mobility. We found some outward mobility from the public sector and the business sector into the higher education sector, which makes up this 5% difference that we see in the graph. So the government sector has witnessed an overall net loss, you know, mostly movement um, to the universities. But generally, we see that there's a very stable system with very little intersectoral mobility between the sectors. So in the next graph, we show this in the Sankey diagram. On the left, you can see the employment sector of graduates during their PhDs. And on the right hand side, you will see the employment sector of graduates um, at the time of the survey. 
So you can see that this green band shows that there's, it's been a very stable system in terms of the higher education sector with very little in and out movement. However, we do see that there's some movement from the government sector into the higher education sector as shown by this orange band. Um, but generally, when we look at the, the sectors of, of graduates employment at the time of the survey, 12% um, were in the government or the public sector, 12% in the business enterprise sector, and then we have smaller percentages in the other education sectors or the private nonprofit sectors. So a, a very um, important trajectory that we see from our study is the postdoctoral fellowship part. We found that 20%, so one in five of our respondents accepted a postdoctoral fellowship after completing their PhD. But you see that this, um, this trend has increased significantly um, over the last 20 years with the number and proportion of postdocs um, growing quite substantially. And we see that the growth among postdocs has been the most pronounced in the economic and management sciences. Um, but you know, over the last 20 years, postdocs have been the best represented among the biological and environmental sciences and in general STEM fields. And we find that students in the social sciences and humanities are the least likely to pursue a postdoctoral fellowship, um, especially in the field of education. So while the majority of postdocs spend an average of three years in a fellowship position, 30% of our respondents who indicated that they did do a postdoctoral fellowship may, reported that they did more than one postdoc. And we, we termed these, these respondents as serial postdocs, those who complete more than one postdoc after, after each other. So, we have found that, you know, both from our quantitative and qualitative data, that the majority of respondents take up a postdoc because there are a lack of employment opportunities, and especially in the academic sector. Um, the biological and environmental sciences are of particular concern based on the slowest growth rate in the postdoctoral fellowships. And we see that in these fields, the biological and environmental sciences, there is the highest likelihood of students taking more than one fellowship and staying in a postdoctoral position for a few years. So although our results show that these fellowships carry benefits, other results lead us to conclude that the science, South African science system is reaching capacity and its ability to absorb the increasingly younger graduates whose lack of full-time employment options lead them to apply and often repeatedly for a finite number of postdoctoral fellowships. So, when we look at the overall findings of a study, we can say that both you know, subjectively, and this was reported by graduates, that doing a PhD remains a good investment. The vast majority of graduates reported that doing a doctoral degree was a worthwhile venture, and only a few and small percentages of our respondents reported having regrets about investing in the doctoral study. Most graduates reported that the the PhD met their expectations um, and that they, they would have made the same decision if asked, if they could choose to do a PhD again. So objectively, as our study shows, given our, our results, that having a doctoral degree nearly guarantees the graduate to remain in the current employment or to find new employment. But it is important to to contextualize the employment of graduates that we see. So not all the graduates, and especially with those with a career in science and academia, find permanent employment um, upon graduation, and have no choice but to pursue one or even multiple postdoctoral fellowships. Um, and even those graduates who find permanent employment are not unanimous about the alignment between the doctoral studies and the current employment positions. Um, and we found small percentages, around 10%, of respondents who indicated that they should have perhaps pursued a doctoral degree in another field or studies um, and that their expectations have not been completely, completely met. So what we have seen over the past 20 years is that the South African science system has effectively been in a state of stasis. Um, there's been very little growth in the number or the positions of academic staff at South African universities and also of scientists outside of academia. And this inevitably negatively impacts on the career opportunities for postgraduates. 
um, for PhD graduates. And, and that leads to the high prevalence of postdoctoral fellowships. So unless the, ESA, the South African science system um, expands to absorb the increasing numbers of doctoral graduates, we might see that the employability of graduates decrease. So we have seen this, this substantial increase in the number of doctoral graduates without the concurrent increase in the capacity at, at, at universities. Um, specific, specific, specifically with relation to academic staff or permanent academic staff positions. So just finally, how do we position these results in the international literature? Um, last year, a, quite a, a, a large study on European graduates was released, um, the Eurodoc survey, and their results were fairly, um, our results substantiate quite, quite a lot of what is happening in Europe. So doctoral holders find employment quickly after graduating, both inside and outside academia, although temporary contracts are common. What we find in South Africa is that the postdoctoral fellowship is, is very common. So unemployment is very low for doctoral graduates and lower than the average across the whole European Union workforce. Um, and that the academic sector remains the largest sector of employment for doctoral graduates, just as the case is in, in South Africa, um, where most doctoral holders are employed as postdocs, assistant or junior professors or research fellows. Um, where our results differ slightly is that in Europe, slightly over half of doctoral holders are working outside of academia in a variety of sectors as analysts and specialists. Um, and we see that, our, that the South African case is higher to two thirds. Um, with very little movement from outside of academia. And this is largely because the largest share of doctoral holders or doctoral enrollments in, our, in South Africa are already employed at South African universities pursuing the doctoral degrees due to the policy imperatives. Um, yes, and that, that is all that I will present today. Um, thank you very much for your time and listening and I'll look forward to the discussion and the questions. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Milandri. Um, there's quite a number of uh, questions that have been asked already. Uh, please go through the Q&A session, um, the Q&A just so that you, you prepare the answers in the meantime. Well, um, let the other um, panelists uh, give us the, the introductory comments and thereafter we will um, have the discussion. I will start with Dr. Amelia. Thank you very much. I think that was a great presentation and it's good that we have a tracer study which uh, looks at the throughput of where our, our graduates are. Um, and, and yes, I mean, one of the things that strikes me is that approximately 70% of PhDs graduates are in academia from a South African point of view. And when we look towards different markets, especially developed markets, so whether it's the likes of Germany, Denmark, UK, USA, you see a, a differential of more than 50% of PhD graduates outside of academia. Um, so moving, moving beyond the scope of academia. Whereas in South Africa, it's, it's limited to approximately 3% of the cohort. So that would just be one of my comments on, um, this is a really great base that we've got now. Uh, that we can track forwards from. Thank you. Uh, then please go ahead with your presentation. Perfect. So the presentation that I'm going to share with you today is one which summarizes cross-sectional and longitudinal research findings on PhD graduate employability, specifically in the corporate sector, spanning the periods 2014 to 2017. And this study was self-funded, so I didn't have, uh, you know, the, the financial support of a, an NRF or a, a DST, but I did have the support of the Office of the Presidency to endorse the study and other supporting partners. It consisted of a nationwide cross-industry study on the distribution of South Africa's PhDs at leading companies which drive the South African economy. This encompassed the top 500 companies listed on the Johannesburg Stock Exchange, as well as other leading local and international entities, the likes of Samsung, Procter & Gamble, BP, Coca-Cola, Toyota, and covered 1,483,575 permanently employed employees working within the economic sector. 
the conceptualization of the study was really came about after observing low numbers of PhDs working across various, various sectors of industry in the South African economy. And at the same time, considering the economic value that PhDs can provide to industry. <clears throat> and we know that South Africa has recognized the value of PhDs. We saw that from Dr. Melandre's study where she was looking at the investment of producing an output of 5,000 PhDs by, per year by 2030. And this also stems from the National Development Plan 2030, where one of the intentions behind the plan is to develop our intellectual talent and our capabilities to help drive innovation in South Africa for economic prosperity. But at the same time, if we are generating the supply of PhDs, it has to be met with adequate demand from employees, whether that's in the academic space, the public space, or private sectors, and be able to absorb PhDs into appropriate positions within the workforce. So the two core areas of um, my studies were one, to identify factors experienced by recent PhD graduates when seeking suitable employment within the economic sector, and we look at this from a corporate point of view, and then secondly, to assess the distribution of PhD graduates permanently employed by the top companies that drive the South African economy. And an additional component that we included in the 2017 study was looking at distribution by race and gender. So we had a demographic component there. Now I'm going to ask Lerato to please play our video, which summarizes the study. A recent study conducted by the postdoctoral research at the University of Pretoria revealed low PhD recruitment in corporate South Africa. The study, which looked at the employability of PhD graduates in South Africa, indicates that graduates are struggling to find employment in the country. A two-year cross-industry investigation on the labor dynamics of South Africa's highest academic degree has thrown up some shocking stats. The country's highest academically qualified are almost exempt from the corporate recruitment mix. Who would have thought that too much of an academic education could uh, be a disqualifier in the corporate arena? Just how rife a problem are we looking at? And is the problem more rife in some sectors as opposed to others? The purpose of this study is about looking at what is happening from an industry point of view because ultimately we need to stimulate our economy and we need to have our smartest brains and talent driving that innovation and development. So this study was looking at what, what the extent of penetration is of PhDs in, uh, in industry. Well, first of all, let me just give you a bit of context in terms of the study. So as you said, it's been going it's a cross-industry study, looking at the last two and a half years, primarily addressing the top 350 corporates in South Africa. So it included the top 200 JSE-listed companies, as well as 150 other leading local international entities like Samsung, Microsoft, Procter & Gamble, and encompassed more than one and a half million employees. Further to that, we also did a study looking at the 14 leading universities in South Africa as, as part of that. Mm -hmm. And what the results have shown that is only 0.07% of the one and a half million people permanently employed by corporate South Africa hold a PhD qualification. And this expands across absolutely every sector of, of industry. It's not uh, whether it is in the retail sector, the mining industry, the financial sector. This study has been endorsed by the Office of the Presidency, National Planning Commission, and addresses almost every large corporation operating under the jurisdiction of each ministry. The results of this study were presented to several ministers, heads of academia, committees, and received the support from the Chair of the Human Resource Development Council, then Deputy President Cyril Ramaphosa. Finally, we will discuss the PhD employability program and look at how the HRDC Council can assist with the repositioning of the PhD as a critical asset to the South African economy. This is an important matter that is sure to advance our development and better our position in the innovation stakes. In 2017, three years after the first study and the recommendation of the Human Resource Development Council that the Department of Science and Technology would address this matter, we returned to field. 
this time measuring the top 500 companies, the top 275 companies listed on the Johannesburg Stock Exchange and 225 other leading local and international entities. The sample comprised 80% of companies that participated in the 2014 study. The results showed that PhDs in corporate South Africa dropped from 955 in 2014 to 809 in 2017, accounting for just 0.05% of the 1.5 million permanent workforce. Despite the fact that during the three-year interval, South African universities produced over 6,000 PhDs. In contrast, Germany alone produces on average 25,000 PhDs per annum and the majority of PhDs in developed countries are employed in industry. For example, half of Germany's PhDs are employed in the private sector. Over 60% of Canada's PhDs work outside academia. In Denmark, 80% of industrial PhDs and 50% of conventional PhDs work in industry. Over 33% of Belgium's and the Netherlands' PhDs work in industry. In the UK, eventually 96% of science PhDs pursue careers outside academia. There are few occasions where we have the opportunity to change the future of the country that we live in. This is one of those times where we can change the current situation and create more alternatives, more options that combine academic institutions, private sectors, public sectors and different industries together and in doing so, increase our competitiveness on a global level and boost our economy. I'm Dr. Amalia gonyas Malka. For the last five years, I have led this research and with a lot of support from people in academia, government ministers and industry leaders made it to what you see today. Five years, two research studies, 14 universities, 500 leading companies and 1.5 million employees. Please lend us a hand to bring change, to enable our country's needs in the knowledge economy to be filled by our intellectual assets. PhDs advance knowledge. And in the new economy, where knowledge is the source of wealth creation, human capital becomes as important as financial capital. Thanks, Lorato. So that's the challenge that's posed out to the audience. What are you or we as the collective going to do about PhD employability? At the end of 2017, after running the last study, out of a population of approximately 29,763 PhDs produced between a period of 1994 to 2016, we had just 0.05% of PhDs working in the top 500 companies across 1.4, nearly 1.5 million people. That amounts to 3% of the PhD population. When you compare that to the likes of Germany, more than 50% of their PhDs working in the economic, in the corporate sector, Belgium, the Netherlands, 33%, et cetera, et cetera. PhDs possess skills of creativity, critical thinking, conceptual thought, amongst others, to help innovate products or services or methods for competitive advantage in the knowledge economy. And looking at the active participants of our global competitors, because we operate in a global world where they've invested into their knowledge workers. And yes, we are investing into our knowledge workers, but we are not giving them the platform to be able to leverage and really provide input to drive our economy forward. As a developing country and economy, South Africa and indeed our colleagues within the continent, are many of them, in fact, I think around about 45% of our PhD output is attributed to SADC region. We can't move forwards and become globally competitive in the knowledge economy without deploying the valuable talents that we've cultivated, but unfortunately underutilized or maybe misutilized. And in assimilating the learnings from other countries, it is possible to create alternatives to the current situation of low employability of PhDs in corporate South Africa, and to be able to offer these individuals more employment options through improved collaboration between 
academic institutions, the private sector, and the public sector, and in so doing, increase South Africa's competitiveness on a global scale and boost our economy. Over to you, Dr. Musio. Thank you so much, Dr. Amalia. Um, your study really complemented what um, Dr. Milendri spoke to um, when earlier on she uh, highlighted the fact that quite a number of graduates uh, are in academia and now you actually bringing in also just highlighting where the rest of the graduates um, are employed. Um, once again, please uh, just look at the chat. There's quite a number of activities that are happening there. The next person is Dr. Kiulebuch, uh, Professor Kiulebuchile, and she will be presenting on her extensive work and experience in teaching to produce innovative um, and entrepreneurial students. And my hope is that she will answer the question that uh, Dr. Amelia asked us, what are we going to do uh, with the challenge that, she, that the two studies just highlighted? Over to you, Dr. Pro, uh, Prof. Gil. Please put is my slide on the slide mode. No, it's is not on the slide, slide mode. mode. Not yet. It's not on the slide, but on my side it shows the slide mode. It's not there yet. Doc, is that on the slide mode? Not on my side, but my, my technology, my internet is slower, so I don't know. And Rato, can you please confirm if on your side it's on slide mode? to make sure that it is on the Please continue the with the presentation in the meantime. They need to see, uh, the, uh, that's what we see. Is my... Is that on a slide? Um, Prof, uh, your sound is very bad. I, I suspect your internet is, is unstable. Uh, we're still not on slide. Mode. Prof? Okay. Um, unfortunately, we're having uh, glitches with uh, Prof Sound. Um, I would like uh, for Babha Debe to actually come in whilst we sort out the, the glitches on, on the other side. Um, he will give us uh, remarks in terms of the DSI policy development and funding programs that talk to um, the PhD programs and the employability of graduates. Uh, thanks, Chair. You can hear me? Yes, we can. Uh, yes, thank you very much. Uh, uh, and welcome uh, to everybody who's joined us and also to the fellow panel uh, panel members. Yeah, uh, I, I come from government and uh, I think that requires of me uh, to have a particular orientation in terms of my presentation. And the orientation is maybe in terms of the response, uh, in terms of what are the programmatic interventions that we have in place. And maybe I should actually sponsor upfront that there may not be 
uh, enough or sufficient to address the problem, but it is the responsibility of government to provide an enabling environment uh, for the retention of you know, high level skills among other things. Uh, now I can, you, you can see my screen, uh, I'm trying to scroll down. You can see it, chat. Um, it hasn't moved, this one, I moved, let's see how. Yeah, uh, it's, it's, it's not moving. Yeah, technology is messing us up today. Oh, oh, all right, let me do like this. Let me unshare and then talk from, uh, stop share. I can talk without uh, sharing anything. I hope it will be able to move from my side. Maybe maybe try and, and share, not put it on slide mode. Okay. Uh, let me just do that. I don't know why, right? Share and not put on slide, on slide mode. Uh, you can see it now? Yes. Oh yeah, it moves then. Thank you so much. Sorry for the inconvenience. Uh, uh, this is my presentation outline. First, uh, just I'm gonna skim through, uh, you know, the rationale and the value proposition, uh, but also the policy environment because I come from, you know, government. But also I want to expand a bit on the PhD pipeline because I think we might be missing a bigger picture in terms of the dynamics leading to you know, the PhD production or the APEX qualification, but also then a number of what are called evidence-based studies that we've conducted as a department in terms of tracking of PhD employability or the career tra trajectories of PhD holders. And then I want to, towards the end, uh, to deliberate a bit with a staffing South African university framework because uh, as it has been said, most of the PhDs actually, uh, they go or they get absorbed by the university sector. And I want to actually expose uh, the audience to, uh, uh, to the initiative in that regard. Uh, much has been said about, I come from the Department of Science and, and Innovation, where a custodian of the science system, uh, we enable, you know, economic development, uh, and the improvement of social conditions of the people uh, through science, technology, and innovation policy. Uh, so you'll know that you know uh, there will be high demand for very specialized skills in areas such as biotechnology, information systems, uh, medical, environmental engineering, climate change, and that we need to develop our research, development, and innovation capabilities. Also, in terms of uh, making a footprint in what we call emerging and new uh, industries, as in the digital economy and the circular economy, but also in, in tackling, you know, both local and global challenges. I use the word local uh, in, in half in, and also in climate change. So we look at the PhD as a driver of innovation. I think Dr. Amalias uh, Konya uh, articulated to the issue of the you know, the human capital and the financial uh, uh, capital, uh, the, the, the strong linkage there. So for us as well, when we started on this task, we realized that we had frozen demographics of the high end skills workforce in the country. Uh, they were all mostly were white and they were male. Uh, so we needed to increase and, you know, make uh, the research development inter enterprise, make it much more inclusive in terms of uh, the incorporation of women and black people, and therefore increase the talent pool uh, for high end human capital, high end human capital in the country. Now, this has been said in terms of the NTP target, in terms of when we started, uh, we did a benchmarking exercise. Uh, around about 2011, there were about 1,100 PhDs graduating in the country uh, per year. And that translated to a weighted average measure of about 22 PhDs per million of population. But as you would know, uh, the National Development Plan instructs us to have uh, 5,000 PhDs graduating by 2030, and that will translate to about 100 PhDs per million of the population uh, uh, by that year. I think it was um, Dr. Malnias Onyazwell who mentioned that, you know, 
uh, Germany graduates about 25,000 PhDs uh, uh, per year and we're standing at about 3,340 PhDs currently. So when we did this benchmarking, there were countries that were producing five times as much in 2011. Uh, and we're looking at an average weighted matter because uh, there's always the denominator of 10 million of a population. And there are others like US and UK, which were producing 10 times as much, you know. And then we also in the decadal plan, in terms of the PhD qualified staff uh, at universities, uh, one in three were PhD qualified in 2011. And the target in the in the national development plan is to actually have two thirds of PhDs uh, of staff members qualified uh, by 2030. Also, we want to increase the component of postgraduate students, uh, but also there is the issue of uh, the cross expenditure on research and development as a percentage of the GDP. Uh, it has oscillated around 0.8 percent, uh, and the target is to reach 1.5 percent by 2030. And there's also a strong correlation between what we call the R&D intensity, in other words, the financial resources invested in research and development and the strength of the, of the economy. So it's a well-established relationship. And then the NTP being the primary uh, driver of the country we want to create or the country we want to live in by 2030, it is then supported by numerous government strategies uh, whether you call up, you you refer to the industrial policy action plan recently, the economic reconstruction and recovery plan, the skills development, all of that are meant to give effect to the national development plan. Uh, on this one, I want to focus on just there was a question even on the uh, on the chat. If you look at the doctoral graduates, your top right hand corner. Uh, in, this is in relation to 2017. This is the Higher Education Management Information Systems data that we produced 3,057 PhDs in that year, and 56% of them were South Africans, and 43% were from outside South Africa. Uh, so, international in this case would include both out of Africa and also uh, offshore, as in as in truly. Uh, overseas countries. So I thought I should flag this. But this one uh, disregard actually the, the y-axis, but it shows uh, the, you know, the South African PhDs that have been decreasing. That's the top line. Uh, the locally born students who are graduating with PhDs have been decreasing at the expense of you know, the foreign PhDs were studying in South African universities, and those have been increasing. So you can see the rate of decrease, although from a bigger number in terms of the South African born students, but also the rate of increase of the foreign born PhD studying in South Africa, uh, but also increasing from a, a smaller base. But you can see they're catching up quite quickly. Uh, now we did a postgraduate retention and conversion study uh, because we're a department that prides itself in what we call evidence-based uh, decision-making and also in terms of formulating policies and interventions based on, on, on the evidence that we get from various studies. Now, in this study, what we found, for example, was that when you, when you look at uh, students who graduated with bachelor's degrees, uh, uh, when you look at students, maybe let me rephrase this. When you look at students who were registered for bachelor's degrees, five years after the base year of registration, 29% of them progressed to, to honors. Uh, by the same analysis as well, when you looked at students who registered uh, for honors degrees, five years after the base year of registration, only 27% of them had progressed to a master's. Similar as well for students who registered for master's degrees five years after the base reference year of first registration, 50% of them uh, had progressed to do a PhD. So we characterize this as a leaky pipeline because in some countries, uh, Germany and Japan, and you know the retention rate, for example, from undergrad because they don't have the honors, undergrad to master's 
is anything between 60% to 70%. But here, five years down the line after the first year of registration, uh, the percentages are. So we characterize this as a, as a leaky pipeline, but also uh, the study revealed that the financial reasons affected more black students than white, and that women were affected by, they cited more uh, of reasons pertaining to family obligations, you know, uh, as, as, as a contributor to this, you know, leaky, uh, this uh, failing to transition from one level of study to the next, even though they may have wished to do so. Now, this is an intervention that we put in as the Department of Science and Innovation. It's an internship program that we started in 2005, six, targeting graduates and prioritizing graduates from historically disadvantaged institutions uh, in the main. Uh, we started in, with numbers 49, uh, and but if you go down through the second column, we found at 6,005 uh, after, I don't know whether 15 years or so, but there were key, two key success factors for this initiative. One, we wanted to see how many of them are employed. So the last but one column will show you that 2,119 interns uh, were employed or received employment during or immediately after the internship program. And then the other key success factor uh, or indicator for this program was that we had prioritized some of these interns for further support, for bursary support, uh, if they wanted to go for further studies after finishing uh, the year of the internship. So also close to a third of them actually transitioned from that internship, internship, internship experience into you know, the next level of, of study. And we had to be careful about this program because we placed the interns in the areas that were in what areas that were aligned or that were that related uh, to their uh, subject, major subjects. Thank you so much. Then uh, the next slide, uh, this is system level, system level tracking of PhD employability. Uh, as I said, on the basis of information, if you, for example, if you look at the quarter labor cost service, uh, the Q3 uh, shows that if you look at the cohort of unemployed people out there, the total of unemployed people, less than 51% uh, had metrics, had less than metric, 37.8% had the high, as the highest qualification they had a metric, and others that will include uh, graduates from the Tibet colleges uh, constituted 7,2% of the unemployed cohort of, of people, and graduates constituted 2,7% of the cohort, total cohort of unemployed uh, people. Now we've got the uh, annual science and technology indicators report, the latest actually, which was launched a few weeks ago. Uh, it shows that unemployment is lower among those uh, with higher levels of education. Uh, i.e., for example, for masters and PhDs, unemployment increased from 2,4% in 2018 uh, to 2,8% in 2019. So this is in the 2020 STI indicators report, as I said, which was launched a few weeks ago. Uh, and then we're producing relatively fewer PhDs, actually, in the areas of, uh, of, of, of engineering, uh, only 7% of uh, the cohort of annual graduating PhDs are, are in engineering. So, and then we triangulate this information, uh, I think, for to ensure that we are not left behind uh, uh, to the rest of the world. Uh, we participate in OECD surveys and also in World Competitiveness Report. So, we did a study also in terms of the mobility of the highly skilled. Uh, this study looked at five universities that produce about 60% of the PhDs in the country. Uh, and it looked at both South African and also uh, PhDs who come from other countries, whether they return to their home countries or whether they stay after completing their PhDs. 
uh, the study found that 10% of the PhDs uh, from, from other countries, they remained in South Africa after completion. But in terms of those who came from Africa, 5% and ended up leaving Africa. In other words, uh, going to other overseas uh, destination. So there's a bit of a brain gain. Uh, then the study by Amalias Gonia, uh, and you have been exposed to that study. The National PhD Tracer Study is a study as well that we commissioned as the Department of Science and Technology, and we have uh, been exposed to the findings of that study. But also we want to commission a study now on the postdoc fellowship program, uh, and particularly to unravel you know, some of the anecdotal information around the permadox, for example. Uh, but as you would see further, down in my slides that uh, we do support postdocs as the next level of transitioning from a PhD student into you know, an academic or research position in a university. So that's gonna come further down. We looked at this, uh, this study as well on one of the studies that we commissioned is the study on building the next cadre of imaging researchers in South Africa. Uh, we found that in that study, only 44% of senior lecturers uh, did not have a PhD, and 82% of lecturers uh, did not have a PhD. And these are 27 Hemis figures. Uh, we did we commissioned a study of postgraduate research training in engineering, uh, consistent with the other trend uh, that I actually explained uh, earlier on, that PhD students in engineering coming from other countries accounted for 3.5% of total enrolled PhD students in 2000. And this has increased to 37.4% in 2014. These are PhD enrollments uh, who, uh, or enrollees who come from outside of South Africa. And then there are fields uh, in engineering that still have to produce a women PhD graduate. graduate. Uh, so agricultural biological engineering, of bioengineering, industrial engineering, mining, mining and mineral engineering, they still do not have a single PhD, women PhD student uh, uh, that they produce. Uh, about 22% of engineering teaching and research staff at universities have PhDs. Uh, and uh, in terms of the career path for most PhDs, they end up uh, PhDs in engineering they end up being absorbed in the financial services sector as they call them the quants because of their quantitative capabilities. Now, this is the post of hey, program. Can I ask that you speed up a bit? We only left with an hour to uh, for the webinar. Yes, uh, the, the postdocs, these are the postdocs that we're finding about 800 per year. Uh, and, and the slide below is the financial commitments. But in terms of the staffing South Africa University program, we're trying to replenish, you know, to regenerate a, 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 a because you know there is an aging professorate. So we're trying to infuse young blood into the academia. So we've got a number of programs under the Staffing South Africa University program. One is the NASP, uh, Next Generation Natural Imaging Scholars Program. And we have supported a number of students, the new generation of academics program, also uh, 760 allocated posts. Uh, uh, well, prioritizing South Africans, Black and women in particular. Also, then the program that looks at the PhD qualification attainment uh, for existing staff uh, uh, complementing the universities. Yeah, just in conclusion, uh, it's been said that. Our system is chronically siloed. Uh, you, you know, there's no movement. There's even of staff and students between science councils, pu public research institutions, universities. Uh, we need to put emphasis on skills development beyond the masters and PhD training uh, for to bring our graduates closer to the needs of of industry. There's a gap there whether you are a first degree graduate or whether you are an advanced degree. Graduate graduate. But also, we administer an RFD tax incentives to promote, you know, uh, and attract back, you know, the R&D functions of the corporate multinationals back into the country. 
So this is a scheme that you, when you demonstrate that you have uh, spent on R&D, and then we rebate, you get a tax rebate. But also then there are issues in terms of the other measures in terms of uh, ensuring the quality of the PhDs that we, 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 we produce. Uh, then the innovation, entrepreneurship and commercialization as would have been expounded upon by Professor Kelebokile uh, Mo, Mo, Mozani uh, is a key you know, value in terms of, uh, of or a key emphasis point in our PhD uh, production pipeline. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Peggy. Uh, uh, Prof. Kulebohile, now this, I'm hoping that the intro that uh, Dr. Peggy has provided uh, will just, um, it's, a, it's an appropriate uh, introduction to you, and I hope that the technology is not going to fail us this time. Uh, please come through. Uh, Dr. Peggy can stop sharing. Thank you so much. Nope, it's still not. It is still not working on our video. Please try and share and then say a little bit more. Let's see, yeah, because your, your presentation is very key in answering some of the questions with regards to the how, so what, what do we do? Just, just talk about the maybe just share my slides. No, it's not working. I want to try that because uh, I, I'm not going to even share my slide. Okay. Yeah, I thought. Okay. No, it's not working, Prof. Your, your, your connection is very bad. Maybe can you use a different form of connection? Maybe your phone uh, and then Lerato maybe um, uh, beam your slides for us. Can we try that? because it would be a pity for us to not hear what it is that you wanted to say. Um, Prof, are you still with us? Can I check whilst we sort out uh, Prof's um, connections? Is there anybody who um, on the line who would like to share their experiences, um, maybe for a minute or two, uh, to share their experiences so that, uh, you know, it's, it's um, from live experiences and not necessarily from the studies that has been presented? Yes. I can, I can hear. Lerato, please mute yourself. Prof, you can start speaking. All right. Prof. Hi, Lerato. Start. Hello. Yes, you can start, Prof. Yeah, I can start speaking. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. And I'm so sorry about the whole hiccups that is just been happening. Uh, uh, but I wanted to share this. I'm just going to start with a very controversial question and say, why must we really send our kids to the legal and corporate in play? We know very well that there's no one who is going to employ them. But when we keep on talking, we keep on talking employability of the case uh, 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 crisis. Why must we really emphasize on somebody to employ them? This is how I have decided to come with a solution. Is there a need for my kids to prove it? Why am saying so that you bear a need? Quite often you hear people say they cannot um, uh, uh, commercialize their research because they, they don't know how to go about it. But my argument is if you write, if you ask a right question, then it's aligned with the, uh, the SDG, Sustainable Development Goal 117, and you're doing research regarding that. It's impossible for me to tell you that you want to be able to say, or to do, you 
that respect the market. The only thing that will happen is when you do the respect mm -hmm. mm -hmm. But I want to have a uh, we need to emphasize that what are those days that we need to do the things that we need to do and to do the things that we need to do. That's what I'm talking about. That's the time and um sure now it you are a bit far prof uh Lerato. um it's, it's not as audible hello okay let's try again Okay, Prof, we, can, we cannot hear you, but from the slides that you've shown so far, I think there is quite a value in them. I don't know if maybe you show the slide, you pause a little bit, we read through it, or we just see what it shows, and then you, you move to the next slide, uh, so that we don't miss this, because the, in, the, the, the message behind what you want to tell us is, why are you doing your PhD? Are you doing a PhD for the sake of doing it, or are you answering a question that will lead to a product out there? So maybe if we just, you know, pause and look at the slides and move because um, even through uh, Lerato's phone, it's still not working. Next slide. I don't know, can they hear me? No, is that what it is? No, Prof, yours is worse. I hope they're not looking at me now. So what happened is now, this is a slide that I just showed. That this was a research that I did. And then with the, by then, they were students. They were students by then. And then the, there was an IP, which uh, I had a patent I tried it uh, in South Africa, in Germany, and where it was granted. And the title of that uh, patent, Lerato, uh, oh, can you hear me? Yes, please proceed, Prof. Okay. And then the title uh, of that of, of, of the of the patent was the one that uh, I think this is not working, but. I, I'm so interested in what Prof wants to say. Um, Lerato, I don't know if maybe we can just see the slides uh, because the connection is still bad even through your connection. So um, maybe just move the slides. Um, it might not necessarily work without the narrative, but just seeing the research and the product that came out of it. Next. Next slide, please. Are you also stuck? I think we um, should open up for a discussion and maybe just leave it uh, as it's flighting and start uh, having the conversation. I asked earlier if um, there is anybody who is who is willing to maybe just share with us um, their life experiences. Uh, before, um, I just want to note uh, that Sponile wanted to ask a question. Uh, Sponile, I don't know if it was a question or if you also just want to share your experiences, but I just want to check if there is anybody uh, who would like to share their experiences. If not, then we will engage because there's quite a number of questions that have been posed on the chat, um, on the chat box. 
So with, if, if we do not have anybody who wants to, then I will read quite a, a few of them. One of the questions, quite a number of the questions that were asked uh, related to the demographics of the individuals who um, have the PhD, who are employed or not employed. And uh, I think I, I allowed uh, David to continue with this presentation because it was answering the, the, the questions that uh, uh, were asked, quite a number of the questions that, that are asked on, on, on the chat box. And um, the other question that was asked is that, uh, or rather something that our part of I just want to check something. Yeah. Yeah. Um, where, can you hear me? I just want to check. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. You can hear me, yes. Okay, I wanted to test something. That's what I'm saying, where I am connected. Okay. Uh, okay. Unfortunately, we're running out of time, so I'm just going to give you five minutes to just do your No, give me, yeah, let me, Rato can just put two slides, three slides. I want to show you what universities are doing that we need not to stop, which we need to stop doing so that we can not talk about the employability of the PhD. Okay. Go down, right. Rato, to the slides. Go down. It's next, next, next slide. Next. I'm not going to talk about next slide. Yes. Let me just talk about, no, the previous one. Quickly, the previous one. This is what the universities are doing currently. We are training the students from idea, proof of concept, and prototype, and we stop there, then they graduate. Then we want them to go and look for a job. But if we can make sure that we make the students to go over this, there is this barrier intensity where the students need to come and understand it, that I've got a prototype. From the prototype, I need to commercialize it. And then when you start talking about the commercialization of the prototype, this is where the students need to understand who I was doing this research for? Do I have a market, the technology readiness level to do, do the market, market assessment and you know, talk about the venture capital scan to understand it? But what is currently happening in the university? Nobody is trying to make sure that the students are doing research that's for the market, that they will be able to sell their product. Next slide, quickly. What is happening, and I can you can testify all of who, all of us here who's got a PhD, we have all graduated where we were using this template. But when you really look at this template, where is this template showing that a student can go and turn her or his research in a manner that is going to create a job? This is just a, a simple way you train the students definitely to publish the article good, to get the qualification good, but this does not train the students to go and create a job. It looks like really we are also promoting to go and, uh, and, 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 and make the students to start a create, to, to start a looking for a job. The next slide. Next, next, Lerato. Yes, what is missing? This is the critical slides that we need to take cognizance of this, not that one. No, you are moving. This is the critical slides that we really need to do. We need to understand when we're training our students for them to do research. Lerato, you are first. Do they have the market? Go to the next slide. Lerato, previous, the previous slide, please, previous, previous. Yes, yeah, don't move, yes. This is the slide that need to answer the question that has been asked to stop training the students to go and look for a job. When we talk about employability, why? If we can start looking at this and how we train our students, when they do their PhD, let's start putting uh, already inside the customer segment for the students when they're gonna do the PhD. Let's also start to looking at, uh, you know, you know the, 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 the competitors, who are the competitors? And let's also start talking, start talking about the key uh, partners, all these things they are missing in the template and how they also going to make money. The only way that we talk about, we talk about the budget, but we don't talk about the financial projection, how the student is also going to make money. One of the crucial thing is the IP intellectual property. Of course, I know that intellectual property belongs to the university. Why don't we also allow the students to license the IP in the university so that the students can also go and start creating jobs by not always telling them that the, the IP The big question here is who are training those PhDs? Do they have this experience or do they have the background in terms of training this PhD to go and turn their project into a community? So what we did, let's let a BT is what we did. We have a, a, a set of policy and a commercialization strategy. Stop here. We have currently we have two companies that we have spin off 
This was a three years RID study at the Royal University. These are the students together with the professor. This is where we go to the class. In the name of the company, it's a solar group class. That is the Trinity Solar Company. And when we do this, we put another student class so that one will be able to license this as well. And automatically, these students, they are definitely not going to be job. These students, they are going to you know, do the work and automation. Now we are talking about the return of investment of the this PhD students. Of course, there will be return on investment. When you look at the royalty, that is also going to be an investment. I'm not going to talk a lot about the royalty. It depends with how much and the people present it. I don't want to put that. This is the first project, a, a, a school of company. Who are they? The, the second is the next slide, Lerato. The second slide. Lerato, next slide. So this is the second, again, uh, slide uh, that we bought. Second school of company from the uh, university. And the third thing, if you look at students doing PhD in biotechnology, food technology, medical technology, those and engineering, those are the kind of students that can be able to spin out their, their research because they've already got product like they said for the product. This is uh, uh, another project, another story spin off the company benefit from getting the digital technology, where again you can see that all the students here we encourage the professors to give them share. But again, it, it also depends that the professors they are working closely with the technology transfer. Director. I understand this more than firm way so that the students are not able to do If you look at all of the students, these students will be automatically absorbed into this skill of company because they have also contributed to the company. And lastly, what we are now doing the next slide, we've got the project that we are currently doing at this. Go to the next slide, then Rato, which I am now currently, but I'm only currently there with them. They have any business with those students. I'm only concentrating on those students that graduate. Can you go back, go to the next slide uh, with the master's and doctorate? In this case, I also did it with the doctorate only. I've also looked at the master's. So, this was our DT investigation page where we get the DT page about the things that we are doing here. So, what we do, we are partner with stakeholders, mainly to address the issue of the graduate of post graduate. Because I always say, why must we try for this? But then we go to employ, use by employer. So what we are doing now, we have the postgraduate students transfer their research into a large or small company, benefit and strength. We are currently having PhD students, and then these students they will be integrated energy, which is the center for entrepreneurship and innovation at the Thank you, Prof. Um, unfortunately, I'm gonna have to to cut you, Prof. Um, management scientists, you can name them. Um, Prof, I'm going to have to cut you, unfortunately. We have quite a number of uh, questions that have been posed, and we'd just like to give um, um, our everybody else a chance to just ask the questions. And I would like to uh, maybe start with the, the live questions. There's quite a number of people who are actually very brave, and they would like to ask uh, live questions. We'll start with uh, Uspongile. Uh, Maputi, are you still online? Sponile? Thank you. Yes, I am. C can you hear me? Yes. Uh, yes, Prof. Uh, um, um, I, I must, I must uh, declare upfront, I'm not a PhD holder, but I'm intending to enroll for the PhD uh, this year. I'm working on the proposal. What I want to find out is the, the, has, the this study, of employability, has it looked on a situation where a person remains in the education education system up until the person graduates with PhD, and versus a situation where I've I've attained my BA degree in ninety nine, went out and worked, came back for the honors degree uh, two hundred one went out and work, came for a different degree, up to, I, 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 up to a point where I, I, I graduate with my MA degree and now about to register. Has that been done? Uh, and what, 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 what are the numbers looking like? But other, other questions that I want to ask is, 
what wisdom is there in including states of foreign nationals on these kinds of studies? Does this not skew reality and disadvantage black, black, black South Africans uh, who I believe really needs assistance and needs help to, to achieve this level of study? Secondly, do we fund foreign nationals? Uh, why is this happening if it is happening in light of what was said about the financial challenges that discourage South Africans from going up to this level of study? But also, has the role of the foreign national supervisor, supervisors been examined? Because the perception out there is that the reason why students, especially students from the African continent, find the South African system easy it's because of, of, of the supervision. It, it, it's so beneficial to them as opposed to, to black South Africans. Uh, lastly, what is the comparison of the output from historically disadvantaged institutions and the research excellence center universities um, when, it, when it comes to employability? Um, what, what does the research show? So I wanted to put in those four questions. I don't know if they are controversial or what, but um, I just wanted to ask them. Uh, thank you, Swangeli. Clearly you've done your research and you are looking at where you're gonna do your, your studies. Um, um, do you wanna take the, uh, um, answer some of the few questions that Swangeli asked? Um, Please unmute yourself. Omilandu, you want Please. to start? Go ahead. Oh, no, no. Right. I'll, I'll wait. Uh, thank you, Smongile. Yeah, the, the issue of the, you know, the pipeline in terms of the movements in and out of the study pipeline up to the level of the PhD, uh, we did not actually exhaust that. And maybe it's something that we need to look at. Remember when I was talking about five years after the first year of registration for an honors, so many would, uh, would then go on to register for a master's. And so it talks to those people who did not proceed uh, continuously to the next level of study. Actually, this data at the NRF in terms of the funded students, in terms of how many of them that entered from the honors level right to the PhD level, uh, and that number is very, very small. Hence, we introduced a policy of you know, continuous funding from entry level at postgraduate level right to the PhD on certain conditions, one of them being the condition that you do well in your study. But we've not looked at, uh, as I said, the zigzagging in and out of the system. Uh, maybe it's something that we'll need to look at. Then the issue of the, uh, the skewed re reality, why do we fund SADC? Uh, or foreign students. Uh, uh, one, maybe the issue of funding is different from, you know, them taking an opportunity to study in South Africa because we want to promote our country as a, uh, you know, as a training uh, environment, particularly PhD training environment uh, for the region and for the continent. Uh, that must be separated from the funding. Uh, we are required in terms of the SADC protocol on education and training to ring fence a portion of our funding uh, uh, for SADC students. Uh, uh, so in terms of the new postgraduate funding policy, uh, we reserve currently 5% of our pot of funds uh, for funding uh, uh, foreign students. Now, uh, the role of foreign nationals uh, in, uh, I would actually refer and maybe uh, I'll drop you an email as well because there is a key study that was commissioned by the minister. It's called the Ministerial Task Team Study on the retention, recruitment and progression of South African Black, underlying South African Black academics uh, in the university sector. So you will actually find, uh, find uh, some of the answers to the questions uh, 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 that you raised here. Actually, this slide is as well about uh, the increase of foreign PhD students in our universities is actually extracted from, from the study. Yeah. Uh, then you raise the issue of the employability of HDIs and HAIs, H, historically disadvantaged institutions. 
institutions and historical advantage institutions in terms of what are the patterns in terms of the employment prospects of graduates. Uh, uh, we do not have that study uh, uh, yet, uh, but I think a conscious decision that we took, as I mentioned, was that in the internship program that we were running as the department, we prioritized uh, graduates from historically disadvantaged institutions. So, uh, yeah, let me stop there at that point. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Uh, Dr. Milandre? Yes, um, I think some very interesting questions. I think those um, highlight to a certain extent many of the efforts that we at Crest try, try and do and, and answer many important questions. Um, but I think, just I want to say that I think I forgot to mention this in my, in my presentation, that the full report is available at the website on SISTIP or CREST's website. And I think many of the questions that I've seen in the Q&A relates to some of the analyses that we did. So um, I, can, I can add the link in the chat for everyone to download. And I think many of the questions will be answered through that. So this was the first sort of comprehensive tracer study and we have such rich data that we found. Um, and unfortunately, you know, for the purpose of the study, our analysis was quite limited to what we can present in, in a um, concise report. But a lot, there's so much data that we can still utilize to answer some of these questions. And among those are the different trajectories that students follow. So we know when we talk about the conversion rates, you know, when we talk about the number of students that go from an honors to master's or a master's to PhD studies, that they are very different. Um, we find different, different results across different fields. Um, and we don't, in the, the current study, we didn't really, um, to a full extent, um, analyze the different trajectories that, that students have. But we have the data and we can certainly, we, we are planning on doing that. Um, in terms of you know, the role of foreign nationals, we know that in South Africa, a large proportion of doctoral graduates are from, from especially the African continent, it's between 40 and 50%. Um, but we did account for that in our study. And also we did some analyses by nationality. Um, and we found very little differences you know, between um, South African and non-South African respondents, except for the fact that most of the non-South African respondents, especially from the African continent, are employed while they are registered for their PhD in South Africa. And most of them hold academic employment positions at their, their respective universities, and then enroll for a PhD at South Africa um, for, you know, for a number of reasons. Um, in terms of the, you know, the role of supervisors, I think that's a very important question. And we at Crest have some, you know, a lot of research projects on this. Um, and we also have a, a doctoral thesis database where we have, um, all the, um, the thesis titles of doctoral graduates over the past 20 years and their supervisors. And we are planning a number of studies around this. So, you know, if you're interested and you wanna have a look at our website, you can, you can see about the different possibilities there. Um, and then just in terms of, you know, the comparison between, between the institutions, we also have that information in our study. We didn't do any specific analyses based on that yet, um, but the data is there. So. Once again, this is a very important point that you raise and some interesting research questions that I don't have an answer for you yet, but that, that we can definitely look into um, in the future. So thanks. Uh, thank you, Dr. Milandre. Uh, we'll just certainly share the link to your um, website so that we can access the, the, the full report. Now, an interesting um, experience, so um, an anonymous attendee is sharing her, his or her experience. Um, it's, it reads, I graduated in 2020, was employed as a postdoc for two years, but, but after two years, I realized I did not want to stay in academia. I have been unable to find employment because I was overqualified for certain jobs, then applied for junior jobs, but I was told I lacked the relevant experience. Lucien says, after my master's, I went out looking for work. I realized that I lacked experience because I had been at university all my life. I had only one choice, continue to do my PhD. I'm gonna ask uh, Professor Messi uh, Makita to um, ask her question. Uh, 
Um, thank you. I had actually sent a message on the chat box. Um, having had the question that was raised regarding those who study further and find themselves unemployed, I think it links well with the message that I sent on the chat box as to, is it possible for um, either the Department of Science and Technology or relevant uh, departments to start a project whereby um, a, a students are identified at undergraduate level um, and provided with financial support and other necessary support so that they can study from undergraduate uh, programs moving up to PhD level um, and in, in the process being provided with necessary internship opportunity for them to get gain necessary skills and experience in that process while they're studying. So in this case that now I take it that there'll be those students who want to study degrees and carry on with honors and masters and PhD before they study. So they can be provided with financial support. In addition to that, opportunities being provided for them to gain uh, industry or, or work experience wherever they want to be. So this will then alleviate this problem of those students who are studying up to PhD level, they're not interested in academia, yet they have no relevant experience for them to enter industry. And that can also be very discouraging because here we are encouraging people to do PhD. When they've done so, there are no opportunities for them to work anywhere else other than academia. And if they go to industry, they're overqualified and they lack experience. But if we can support them while they're studying and providing uh, internship opportunity, they can continue with their studies and gaining experience so that they can be employable. That way we can achieve the goal that we are setting of increasing PhD graduate without compromising on their employability because we are creating also a workplace experience for them while they're studying as well. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Prof. It also links to um, the question, the, this point that uh, we've had made earlier about the investment in, in R&D in the country and also the involvement. Um, I think Amelia, uh, Leah, earlier on you spoke about the, the PhDs and, and where they are in terms of um, the corporate sector. But the question is, what is the involvement of um, the industry in South Africa? One of the in, in one of the chats, somebody mentioned that in Europe, you find that organizations actually um, fund the PhD. So when you go to a, any given university, you find that the scholarships, they are linked to a project that is funded by a, 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 a certain organization. And the question is, to what extent uh, would that alleviate the problem that we have um, in the country? If we want uh, data scientists who have PhDs, uh, should the banks and your state's essays and all the other uh, industry that require data scientists, should they be investing in that so that we don't just produce scientists for the sake of producing them, but they would then have um, empl employment. I mean, your assault, that's what they are doing. What's your take on that question? Dr. Amalia? I think part of the reality here is, and it's been highlighted before, the fact is that a lot of our students are, are working full time. And in my study, yes, I've looked at the corporate side of things as opposed to the academic side of things, but it's, it's the same component. You're still working and, and studying simultaneously. So you're building up experience within different organizations. And if you continue to study and work with an organization, you're fine in terms of your track and let's say your employment. If you exit an industry and decide to study full-time, that is where you have to contend with trying to come back into an industry sector. And that is where people will experience issues of being told that they're overqualified, that they're too technical, that they're gonna ask for too much money uh, and a myriad of excuses. And in fact, one of my calls out to everyone in this panel is, please go and apply for an industry position and, and see what they say. These are the types of, of setbacks that you'll experience. And part of this is that people don't have a view of what a PhD can do. 
the, the value of the transferable skills that are in place, um, which we've, we've all spoken about. Uh, some of the things that I think potentially as fixers, um, if you want to call it that way, you were talking about data scientists earlier. If we are doing relevant research and relevant research for different industries, uh, whether there's a, an economic edge onto that or, or whatever the need is. So if I am doing something in the automotive sector, perhaps there's initiative that BMW is doing or, or Toyota is doing, and they're wanting to do something with the metaverse or they're trying to do something in AI. Why don't we use those relevant projects with students so that they can start working and doing something that is meaningful for an organization or a sector of industry, and that there is an opportunity of employment with one of these organizations. It's taking the research from, and yes, I am uh, an, an, an applied researcher, but it's taking that research and through a full value chain. And at the same time as that having a practical approach to it, from an academic point of view, you're still going to be able to generate your KPIs of whether it is a publication output, a conference output, a book output, it's still going to be complementing the KPIs of both the individual as well as the institution. Thank you. Um, I'd like to give Ngosno Tando uh, Chamani um, some time to share your experience. Please be brief uh, so that we can have uh, give others a chance as well. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much for that opportunity. I hope you, you can hear me. Yes, we can. Hello. Yes, you may. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, that I I'd like to just start by um, complimenting all our presenters today. Thank you so much. And thank you for putting together such a wonderful and um, insightful webinar. Well, um, I currently work for the South African Police Services and in the Forensic Science Laboratory. I recently graduated with a PhD in public health. Um, however, now I noticed that in my environment, the promotions and the grading policy in the organization does not recognize uh, qualifications beyond any NQF level seven. So everything, anything that they talk about is just experience, um, years of experience, as well as the NQF level, uh, NQF level up to seven only, nothing more than that. So um, I am now I'm applying outside. However, I do not have the relevant experience that is required by um, by the public health sector. So um, my question was is, is actually um, what I would I would like to ask about is if uh, enough research has been done to uh, check on the involvement of the public sector as well as how what have has been done to make the managers in the public sector to be aware of the value of uh, PhDs and to be able to incorporate this into this into their policies so that people will be encouraged to study further and that because they will if, if they feel that they are recognized but through promotions or maybe through a grading because the the policy um, the recognition or promotions of people who have studied while they were with in the organization. So I've always been with the same organization and I've never re received any recognition from my PSC. They employed me with a Technology is now missing. Thank you. But thank you so much. Um, and when you said you were working for SEPS, I was like, mm, oh, okay. <laughs> it's interesting. It's actually giving us a different perspective of where PhDs can be employed. Um, and obviously then there are challenges. When you go to a, a, a normal R&D environment, your PhD is like, yeah, the more qualifications you have, the more research qualifications you have, the more recognized they are. And then there are other um, sectors where it is more the experience that is recognized. But Babi, I don't know if you want to maybe respond to it? No. You are muted. Dr. Oh. I can respond to that. Yes. Okay, please go ahead. Please go ahead, Prof. Yes, I can respond to that. 
Uh, your technology. The problem is when we usually do that. Can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear me now? Yes, I was saying the problem is that when we do research, especially that's supposed to do with policymaker, we don't usually go and do kind of a design thinking and sit down with them so that we can see exactly what is missing so that when we go back and do research, we can really complement what is missing. We go ahead and do research and at the end of the day, when you go back to them, they also don't understand because they were not involved. In this kind of thing, I always said, especially if the research is going to in, uh, involve policymakers, let's involve them from the onset of the research so that you can also be able to know what are you going to tell it's pointless we get excited with this exciting data of the policy should look like this but at the end of the day we didn't involve them and i think this is where we need to start using design thinking as a tool when we start approaching phd project thank you thank you um Karas spoke uh, is asking a question um the, there's the there was a concern that do you need or a question whether do you need to do your master's when you finish your master's, take a gap year, uh, for lack of a better word, where you go seek for employment and know what the employer is looking for. And as it was suggested earlier, then you do your PhD within, uh, at least now knowing what, what the employer or the prospective employers are looking for. But Kara is saying um, many PhD opportunities have an age limit, which is a barrier to accessing funding. What is being done to increase or do away with this barrier? That's a question that Kara is posing. And I think that one is a policy related or a funder. It's, it's a funder related question rather. Um, so. Can, uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, can I give it a, a try, that question? Yes. The, the policy funding question. Uh, the 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 predicament that we find ourselves in is one in terms of the limited pot of funding uh, uh, from government. I think there is still a lot that needs to be done in terms of mobilizing industry and other social partners to come and board, particularly in relation to, you know, the funding of postgraduate studies. Uh, as an example. And as far as comments about 46 billion rands in two, towards undergraduate funding, and we only administer through the National Research Foundation only 1 billion rands uh, towards postgraduate uh, 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 support. And we introduced a policy of funding some of the students uh, at full cost. And that has really shrunk you know, the percentage of students that we cover. Uh, so a num a decisions had to be made in terms of efficiencies, you know, one, we wanted to prioritize people who want to go right up to the level of the PhD and in the end, give us a, a longish useful life after the PhD in terms of, you know, entering the research uh, terrain and having a number of years ahead of them to make contributions in that space. Uh, so we wanted to bring down the average age at PhD completion. Uh, a study that was done in 2010, it showed us that on average, our PhD students completed their PhDs at the age of 40. So there was a deliberate drive to say, let's bring that age down. Uh, so we started then putting the age limits that for you to qualify for an honors, uh, bearing in mind that it's a limited part of funding, uh, uh, you need to be 26 years at the point of applying for your master's, 28, uh, 26 at the point of applying for your honors, 28 at the point of applying for your master's, and you need to be 32 at the point of applying for your PhD, and then so that you complete by age 35. However, there's an exception to say then for people who are working in the knowledge economy, organizations, research and development, higher education, science councils, uh, those whose you know, core responsibilities is knowledge generation uh, and research, those are funded through other instruments, uh, such as the Tutuga, the Black Advancement, you know, a, a portfolio of other programs that are, are aimed at funding researchers, but incorporating and an aspect of supporting them towards completing their PhDs. 
So it was an issue of, you know, in the face of limited resources, how then do we use them uh, uh, optimally? Thanks you. Um, I, I saw uh, Dr. Romila Mahara just uh, on the chat and I thought I wasn't going to uh, ask her to answer the question, but I, I see that her hand is up. Um, Dr. Romila? Uh, thank you, Chair, um, and thank you to the panelists uh, and the participants. I, I found this to be a very uh, enlightening uh, discussion. Uh, as somebody who uh, manages <clears throat> postgraduate funding at the NRF, <clears throat> I've, I've been in the space now for, for well over a decade, and we started off this journey, <clears throat> excuse me, when we were producing 27 PhDs per million population. So we have come a long way. We've transformed the demographic profile of our graduates. It's still concerning that while we've increased, uh, we're now producing more black PhD graduates, um, but that they're not South African uh, or not enough of them are South African. And we need to now focus on that. But a, a striking uh, point that, that comes through now is the continued need to demystify the PhD and for the, the sector, particularly for private sector, to understand the value of the PhD. I, I did raise a, a question to uh, Dr. Amalia on regarding her study. Um, in the countries where we find that there's large numbers of PhDs being employed in the private sector, there is usually a large R&D sector. And um, I, I am particularly interested in her study because I think that's where uh, uh, a lot of work needs to be done to work together with the private sector to see which are the areas in which we should be investing in doctoral training for socioeconomic benefit. Now, there are tax incentives for the private sector to invest in postgraduate uh, uh, support, and that's something we certainly uh, want to pick up on. Um, Professor Motuang also um, has been spot on in terms of what we're not doing in the sector, and that is not creating the mindset of entrepreneurships in our postgraduate students and not creating the, enough of those opportunities uh, for postgraduate training. So I think those are perhaps two key levers that we need to um, focus on um, so that we do produce the kind of postgraduates we need to drive uh, socioeconomic transformations. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Dr. Malia, you want to take a step on it? Mm, sure, I, I completely support um, uh, Dr. Maharaja's uh, perspectives. I, every single entity, organization, sector of industry, there are opportunities for research. There's opportunities to create R&D elements. And I think this is a case of really developing stronger partnerships, whether it is with a particular company, whether it was with a sector of industry to motivate and, and take things ahead. I, several years ago, I remember having a, a presentation that I gave to um, Minister Siobong Akwele when he was at telecommunications. And one of the things he said, he said, as a South African organizations, we are, we're not manufacturing anything. We're not producing anything. We're just consumers. And we have to change that narrative and become producers, become manufacturers. And the only way we can do that is if we um, stop hanging on to old mindsets. I'm someone earlier, I know Professor Motong has, has been very vocal about this of changing that narrative of waiting for jobs to land in our lap, but going out and creating them. So we need to be creating new sectors. And that would really be part of my um, uh, form of, of answering this is, is really going out there and changing things. Um, 
we've that's the only way we're going to progress i mean we are in in negative digits if we think about things from a gdp point of view and i i'm unfortunately i i mean no disrespect to all the colleagues in in the space here but um academia and government are not going to be driving the economy and, and making money that that's not your job but the corporate sector is and entrepreneurship is and i really believe that that's where we need to be investing some of our efforts to start lifting the economy Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. There's a question um, uh, to Ubam Khadeba. It says, I thought that Dr. Fanil and Chris study is telling us that we must now slow down the number of people doing PhDs because the absorptive capacity of the various sectors is getting rich, uh, has re uh, we've reached it now. So why, at which point are we going to say that um, the NDP is wrong? Uh, why are we still pushing 500, uh, 5,000 PhDs per Per year, and what is it that we're going to do to change um, the, 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 the narrative? Uh, Dr. Amalea, you are answering it. I, I would like Mr. Khadebe to, to comment on this, but I don't think that we are doing the wrong thing. This is all about development. This is all about driving our economy forwards and our talent forwards. So I certainly don't think the NDP is wrong. But we have to look at ways where we are going to be able to absorb that talent into the market. Because even if they were doing their PhDs, where, where are they? Where, where are they going? But having that edge is what is going to advance things. And I think it was Sibon Gile earlier, he was um, talking about the fact that we are producing a lot of PhDs from within the continent. But if we see this as an export market, if we see this as producing knowledge workers and PhDs that can go forward and represent South Africa up into the continent, it's still an asset. So I definitely do not think that we should be um, reducing our take on producing our talent. Um, thank you, that's my comment. Thank you. Milandri, we reach, we, we're slowly reaching the end of our webinar. Sure, and I think we're going to a very important point, which I don't think we have an answer to at this stage, but that, that brings us to what is the point of the PhD, what should the point of the PhD be? Um, and, you know, trying to find the link, as we've talked about, between the skills that are needed in industry um, and the knowledge economy and the skills that are being produced as, as doctoral graduates. Um, and the Council for Higher Education just released um, their review of doctoral degree, and they state you know, to them what they 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 see as the purpose of the PhD. And it remains to a large extent, you know, an endeavor of scholarship and critical thinking. And that's what's needed in the higher education sector. So this is a very complex question and it's certainly not unique to South Africa because many, you know, other countries struggle with the same issue. But this this brings us really down to what when you're looking at PhD graduates, what is the point and the purpose of it? And we should very be very um specific when we talk about this, that there are very distinct fields between differences, uh, differences between fields um, and, and disciplines, and that, you know, one model doesn't certainly fit all, um, and that we should be, be, be very mindful of this um, in our discussions. So, yeah, thank you. Thank you so uh, maybe, maybe just to add on, 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 on to that question, just by way of a, a personal reflection, uh, when I joined the department 2005, uh, uh, we, we, from 2005, we've seen successive cohorts of PhDs graduating. Uh, but also, as they were graduating, there were a number of institutions over the time period that were created, research and development institutions. When I joined, there was no SAMSA, for example, South African National Space Agency, there was SWIFT. We're not even hosting the square kilometer array. There was no technology innovation agency. There was no need more. So for me, the question of uh, do you stop? Uh, it's a it's a chicken and egg situation uh, because it is these PhDs that actually create demand for institutions, and the institutions then demand as well. You know uh, uh, the PhDs. Uh, and 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 somehow even investments as well they follow you know, the existence of uh, high level human resources. Uh, and I'm not talking about even investments coming from the country, but investments that, that could come from elsewhere. 
Uh, I could share with you an anecdote of one president. Who Actually, no, you know, I think we, we, we're running out of time. I just wanted to give Prof Gio a, 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 a minute or so to just uh, just give us her concluding remarks. And um, in case we get, we get cut um, before we, we end, I'd just like to thank everybody for participating. But Prof Gio, um, technology really messed us up, but uh, please yes. just give us I'll, I'll, we'll, we'll arrange it again. I'll come and do a presentation. Thank you so much for that. I don't think the problem here is the PhD being trained. We need to be brutally honest and take a bull by its horn. And I guess I can do that even from academia. The problem here is, the people that are training PhD students, do they have that entrepreneurial mindset? Are they also able to commercialize their research? That's one of the things that we need to take care of. And we, if they don't, nothing stops them to partnership with the industry, where the industry will be able to license the technology and then the students can be able to create a job from what they have done. I mean, that's what I'm saying. I guess I will uh, involve uh, uh, Dr. Melandri and, and Dr. Amalia that we are doing a case study, but I said, let me do this case study with DUT because I can take care of the IP issues where uh, Alan Gray has come on board, Harambi has come on board. What we're doing, we are going to pilot 15 postgraduate students, but only those ones that graduated and from Durban University of Technology that are staying at home, not looking for a job. We want to take their own master's topic and their own that graduated with a prototype and turn that because we are kind of having a small resources because we've got uh, an innovation center where we are going to incubate them and to accelerate that program. And I think uh, Dr. Hadebe, uh, the Department of Science and Innovation needs to start having an earmark funding for that so that people with a little bit of expertise, we can assist this postgraduate student. And I thank you, including NRF. I know they do a lot in the R&D, which I really uh, thank them for that because they assist the student up to the uh, prototype level. Now, DSI and TIA must check in into taking that prototype upscaling. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Prof. Uh, you've been challenged. I'd like to thank everybody for participating, our speakers, our panelists, and everybody else who uh, posed the questions. Unfortunately, we could not go through all your questions, uh, but a lot of the, some of the ones that we asked, uh, I think the answers we would find them in 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 the in the actual report that uh, Milandri would uh, provide us with the information on how to access it. I'd like to thank everybody and wish you a good a good afternoon. And um, the, the, the recording will be available on the NRF Facebook page uh, for those who want to um, remind themselves of what it is that we spoke about. Um, we will see you again. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Much appreciated. Bye bye, thank colleagues. You. Bye bye. Thank, thank you very much. much. And this is the beginning. Yes.